What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Tell Me More podcast presented by Major League Success. I have Troy Marsh with us from the Marsh Home Group at Keller Williams. Uh, Troy, thank you so much for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, we, we've known each other, um, oh, man, I don't even know, a handful of years now. Obviously, we've both been in the business forever, but you know, I always say like there's a difference between social media friends and then, you know, people that you know that are in the business. And, um, you know, I think you and I, we've never really sat down and got to um, really talk about the journey, right, of, of getting into the business. And um, Troy, we always on here specifically, we start at the very, very, very beginning and we talk about what was life like for you growing up. So could you share a little bit about you know, just growing up, you know, elementary school, high school, kind of hobbies, interests, things along those lines. Man, we are going way back. <laughs> I, was, I was prepared like last formal education. Um, no, no, we couch. start from the beginning. <laughs> you have a couch in there? Maybe I should just come join you in the studio. Um, no, just kidding. Um, so, yeah, grew up in the Toledo area, moved to Sylvania, which is a suburb on the west side of Toledo. Uh, when I was in middle school, um, growing up, like I was pretty active guy, played sports, um, liked to snowboard, actually, that kind of led to my degree, graduated from high school, came down to Columbus to go to Ohio State, and I was pursuing a degree in meteorology and wanted to use it to become an avalanche forecaster. And the reason I wanted to be an avalanche forecaster is because you got to basically get dropped out of a helicopter and go snowboard <laughs> in areas where there was a bunch of fresh powder and figure out whether people were going to die from it or not. So, how, how, well, I got to stop you, first of all, all right. because my wife's from Northwest Ohio and there's no hills in Northwest Ohio. So how did you even get into snowboarding to begin with? Yeah. So my, <laughs> my family... Um, my grandfather actually was into skiing and so that got my mom and her sister and her husband my parents and my aunt and uncle we would go out to colorado once a year we'd like pile into a van uh, they lived in in western michigan so we would meet in chicago and my uncle laid tile so he built like this platform bed in the back i'll never forget these memories and like we would basically drive 24 straight hours out there to Colorado. There'd be eight of us in this full size van. The kids would sleep in the back and the parents would rotate driving. Um, and we did that for a bunch of years when I was younger. And so just fell in love with skiing and snowboarding from that. And uh, and I, I liked weather too, but avalanche forecasting made it, you know, even more exciting. So. Uh I mean, first that was, you know, the, the bed platform in the back of the van, like now it's trendy, right? Everyone wants to do that, you know? Yeah. So you guys are ahead of your time on, on that. Um, but I don't know if I've ever met anyone that really wanted to go into, to that. Who, who knew that that was an actual field that you could study within, uh, you know, meteorology. So, um, that's awesome. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a great story. <laughs> So anyway, so came to Ohio State. Um, I did get my degree in me in called atmospheric sciences here at Ohio State, but I also started working at a restaurant during college. And um, one of my regulars was a real estate agent. Hmm. And so I was he would come in him and his wife would come in like all the time because when you're, you know, if you don't have kids, it's probably usually easier and not that much more expensive to come eat, eat out versus cooking a whole meal. And so they would come in a couple times a week and they would always request me. And so we just got to talking. And one day he's like, have you ever thought about being a real estate agent? I'm like, dude, I'm getting a degree in meteorology. No, never thought about real estate. And he, and so he just said like, Hey, well, I think you should go get your license. And I was like, well, what's it take? And he's like, you know, 1500 bucks or 1200 bucks or whatever it was back then and three weeks of your time. And I'm like, well, you know, the quarter is almost over. I don't really have anything going on this summer. So why not? So I think he split the cost with me or something, but I'm like, Hey, I'm 20 grand in on a degree that I really like. I want to be an avalanche forecaster, but I'm sick of math and science classes. 
um, I had to take math like through differential equations with like the fifth calculus class and it was terrible. <laughs> and I was like, everybody told me that grad school was more of that. And I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want to be an avalanche forecaster that bad. So <laughs> went and got my real estate license the summer before. Uh, actually, I was going to stay one extra quarter. I could have graduated in the spring but was going to stay one extra quarter to take this class that I needed if I ever was going to go to grad school. Um, and then also got to get football tickets one more year. So it was like, and back then, like a quarter was like 1500 bucks. So it wasn't that big of a deal. So anyways, got my um, real estate license, started in real estate, loved it, decided that I really didn't need to go back and take that class. So I went and got my football tickets first then canceled my classes at Ohio State, <laughs> did two classes online at Columbus State, like just GE, GECs, I think they were called back then, just to be able to graduate and get my degree. And um, and that was, that was really it, man. Never worked a day in my life as a college grad in anything other than real estate. <laughs> That's so awesome. And, and just a quick you know, PSA for anyone, you know, bartender, waiter, waitress, like real estate is right up your alley. So if you're looking for a career change, I always joke, you know, but it's true. Like, I think there's six or seven agents, you know, on our team that came from the food service industry, you know, like if you're good with people, this is a great business for you to get into. Uh, because we can teach you the rest, right? We can yeah. teach you the real estate stuff. Um, I mean, I came out of my shell. I would not have, I can't say never because you can never say never, but definitely um, I would co have considered myself somewhat shy. Like I was really comfortable with people once I got to know you, but yeah. I wasn't the kind of guy who was going to go be the life of the party with a bunch of people I'd never met before but serving just brings that out of you. You know, you walk up to the table, you've got to establish rapport quickly. Um, you know, you've got to deal with issues as they arise, like all the things that real estate, I mean, it all happens within a one hour, you know, experience. Um, and so I think it's a great way. I've always found servers and bartenders are good. Also, um, teachers and nurses are yeah. also really good because they usually have great spheres. So yeah. your teacher or nurse, you're tired of of the healthcare industry post COVID, real estate's for you. I guarantee it. So Troy, you go to college and and it's funny, you said calculus to like the fifth degree or whatever. I went to calculus and failed calcul the first calculus. And that's what made me make a decision with my my degree. Um how was that conversation like with, you know, your parents and, and those things when it, when it's like, Hey, you know, you're going to school. We, you know, you just invested, you know, all this money into this, you know, education. And now, Oh, by the way, I'm not doing that. And I'm jumping into a career that is, you know, com commission based. What was that conversation like for you? And did you have doubters, supporters where, you know, where did everyone fall on your end on your yeah, side? That's, of things? A, that's a great question. I, to be honest with you, I don't remember having any doubters, but I don't, for those people that know me, I do have a fairly strong personality. Um, and so I don't know, maybe people were scared to doubt me or whatever, <laughs> but I don't really even remember how I told my parents. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I, I started it while I was finishing school also. So I think it was, I was still serving for the first few months. And so I think it was kind of like, well, probably everybody thought like, oh, this is just a fad. Like, you know, he's going to do something else, whatever, whatever. My, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, I mean, she was a year behind me, so she was still in college. So it was kind of like, it wasn't a huge deal. Um, I don't think back then. Now, I think it's a bigger deal for people who are leaving a career at, you know, 30 some years old with kids and all of that stuff. It's, it's definitely a different conversation. Yeah. What year did you uh, graduate? What year did you get your license? Uh, Oh, four for both. Okay. Okay. Um, so 2004, you decide that I'm going to, I'm going to get my license. Um, now did you go and work with the, the agent that, you know, kind of planted that seed? 
Yeah. So just for a short time, um, he was a great guy, hustler, actually, like thinking back to what he was doing, he was doing all Mike Ferry stuff. Um, and he had, I want to say if my mind serves me correctly, he had been doing it for like two years and he had like 20 some active listings. Like mm -hmm. he was crushing it, just cold calling all the time. But he was one of those guys. Um, and if you're listening, Chris Johnson, like, thank you for, for getting me into real estate. Cause it definitely changed my life, um, and my family's trajectory forever. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but he's one of those guys that had a short attention span, like so many of us, right. In this industry. <laughs> um, and we can get into that later, how that's bit me a few times, but, um, but he ended up like getting out of real estate. I left his team because he was all over the place. And then he got into mortgage and then I know he did some website design stuff. And he did a few other things. Um, I still see him pop up here and there on social media. Um, but great guy, just um, hustler. He goes all in on these things and then gets bored and then jumps to the next thing, which I'm sure we may talk about like ways to have success and how that's the easiest way to fail in this business is to jump from thing to thing to thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I joined his team for nine months and then went... Uh, then that's when I moved to KW. I was with Remax with him, moved to KW just because the monthly fees were less. To be honest, that was really the only reason. Um, and then uh, really just embraced the growth mindset, education, culture. Um, and I know back then there weren't there wasn't as much free education out there. I feel, I feel like, and I, when did you get licensed again? I got it in 2011. Okay. But I feel like even in 2011, like there just wasn't like the, the amount internet of wasn't, free education. Yeah, the the like, internet it was, wasn't what it was, what it is. No, now. and everybody was way more like, this is my information. Like I'm not sharing, like this type of thing just didn't happen. And so at the time, it was kind of what Keller Williams was known for was just being open book and sharing and everything else, actually. Um, yeah. I, so so I just had some people say like, oh, you should come over here. And I'm like, well, are your top agents going to share their listing presentation? And they're like, they're not doing that. And I'm like, well, they are. And so, like, you know, if if you your people start doing that, I'll talk to you. But otherwise, like, I'm going to stay over here where these people that have been doing it for 30 years um, are willing to share their stuff with me and give me, you know, a, a leg up because I really don't want to learn by making the same mistakes that everybody else did. Yeah. Um, so really dove into education. And I would say, like, that's what got me through. Obviously, for those of you that know what happened in the real estate market from 04 to 11 when John got in, uh, lots of change. But one of the biggest um, benefits of the fact that I had like literally I turned 22 and got my license three days later. And so I was living in Columbus. I always joke like my friends didn't even know where they were sleeping that night. They were more worried about where where they were going to get a drink that night than where they were sleeping that night. And so I didn't actually sell a house to somebody I knew because I wasn't from here, had no sphere yeah. here until I had been in the business for three years. And I firmly believe that that prepared me the best possible way for, for the downturn um, because I had to scrap for every one of those deals. And so then I, you know, for, fast forward three, three and a half years later, and all of my friends were turning 25, 26, which now is still young to buy your first house. Back yeah. then, I feel like more people were buying at that age. And so then my friends started buying and it was like, oh man, this is awesome. Like, you mean I don't <laughs> have to go like, so it was like 2008 what? And the prices are dropping. So now it makes complete sense because it's way less than rent. So in a lot of ways, like, those first three or four years where I was young and I looked like I was 15, even though I was 22, 23, and then also uh, just prepared me. So I didn't feel like the downturn in the market really impacted me. If anything, it was easier because there were fewer agents in the market. Well, um, let's dive in. Let's dive into that. You know what? You know, the first couple of years and I was like you, right? 22, 
just graduated college. Um, I, I'm not from here. Like at my, for me, it was leads. That's when internet leads were becoming the thing, right? And it was just starting with Boomtown and you had Tiger leads and, and all of that. What did you focus on? You know, because you didn't have that sphere and you, obviously your friends weren't buying, you know. Um, yeah. What what did you focus on those first couple of years to really kind of build your business? And was it success or was it up and down or, or was it some failure in there? Yeah, that's a great question. So there was, um, my, I would say that I didn't focus as much as I could have focused until probably about 2007 or eight. Um, so the first year I was on that other team, I was on the team with the guy who got me into the business and he was big Mike Ferry guy. So it was literally all cold calling. Like I remember I would cold call the phone book, dude. I would go, <laughs> I would go hand out like flyers at apartment complexes. And then the manager would call me and be like, come over here and clean up all these flyers because they're blowing all over the place. You know, like I did open houses um, at just everything, you know, sign calls, whatever. Then when I moved to KW, it was more of the same, really. I would cold call expireds and fizbos um but honestly like building relationships so i built relationships with agents in the office i mean that was when kw was small here so like when i joined the office there were only 40 agents and so i just went to all of the classes and so the experienced agents would see that i was a hustler and so i remember some of my clients that have bought several houses from me now were like hand me down leads, you know, like, Hey, I don't want yeah. to sell this hundred thousand dollar house. Um, so give me a referral fee. And I was like, thank you. You know, like my expenses were like probably $1,500 a month. And it was like, Hey, if I could sell a hundred thousand dollar house, like I was doing just fine. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, that's how I built it. Then I got into internet leads. I joined another team. Um, probably 2007 ish. Um, and we were doing internet leads, uh, kind of on the bleeding edge. I mean, I always joke when people complain about internet leads now, because back then I used to get, we had two websites, we had a condo website and a house website. Okay. And so that was pretty much the only thing when we first started getting them, that was the only thing I knew is if it came from the <laughs> condo website, then at least they were looking for a condo. So I could say, hey, I saw you were on our website looking for condos. And if they came from the house website and then over time it evolved, but it's like what we have today where it's like, you know, every property that they looked at and like it automatically sets a search up. I mean, I was just, I was using pieces of printed paper that had their names on it. Like I had a binder and I was just like filling those out. And so, um, so yeah, and I built I built my business off of internet leads, uh, and I, you know, basically all the way through then that was my main source of not mets. Um, I did the open house thing pretty consistently. I wasn't great at it back then. I would say I'm way better at it now. Um, but I think just staying consistent with with motion, and sometimes that's a bad word, but I feel like all too often new agents they just they want to treat their time the same way as a mega agent, meaning like they're so worried about whether they're spending time doing the best activities. And then they're, they end up doing like nothing for 90% of the time. And it create it's just not good for your psyche. And so yeah. standing at an open house, if I get to what, you know, run into three people, cause back in 2010, eight, seven, like, you might sit at a two hour open house and get like one person that comes through or two people. That was, that that was like a good day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so you, uh, so just, but, but the practice that came from those in terms of having those conversations with people, recognizing the tire kickers versus the, the serious people, like it just, like you said, like we were talking before, when you don't spend that much time reflecting on this stuff, but when you do, you realize that, you know, all of those things, whether they worked or didn't work, as long as you're committed to seeing it through to the end, they all played a part in helping you become, you know, what eventually yeah. hopefully is successful. Right. 
And you said something so, so important that I try to uh, talk to as many agents about. And, and I think it's like, it's one of those things where I think it goes in one ear and out the other. And that's like, just be in the office. You know, obviously I know things these days are a little bit different. You know, a lot of people work from home, but um, I remember one of the best clients I ever got was from an agent across the hall when I was at Keller Williams and um, it was on a foreclosure. She showed him the home. He rolled up in a motorcycle and she didn't feel safe, right? Like, you know, she just didn't get that vibe. She's like, Hey John, you want to work? And I'm like, yeah, I'll work at $40,000, you know, cash buyer, investor, whatever. Um, you know, I think over the years, I think he's probably bought or sold 10, 12, 14 homes through me. Um, and you had those opportunities, right? And like, you know, as agents, it's just being around the business, being around other agents, like, you know, volunteering your time to help some of those top producers that are in your brokerage or in your office, because they will give you those opportunities. And yeah, they, they may not be like that golden egg, right? But if you work it, you're going to, you're going to learn a lot um, by having just those opportunities. Whereas if you didn't go into the office and people don't know who you are, you know, you may miss out on a lot. Yeah. I mean the way, so I had joined, I actually was on another team for a short time, which I learned a lot on there. But then the way that I got onto the team with the internet leads was she had a bunch of internet leads and didn't have anybody to take them. So I was giving two splits right on these leads. But for me, it was about the experience. So my whole philosophy when I didn't have kids and I was like hustling during that time was number one, I just wanted to do better this year than I did last year. And that's not necessarily a, a philosophy that I would recommend everybody go into life with. But in some ways, it's like I heard uh, I don't know if you've ever listened to Alex Hermosi, but yeah. he has a podcast yeah. and he's like a he, I think he he's worth like two hundred million dollars and he's 32 years old. But he just released one that I happened to pop on yesterday and he was talking about how your 20s are just all about like meeting the right people and putting yourself in situations where you can learn the most to prepare yourself to earn the most, like when you get into your late twenties and early thirties. And so that's like, I don't know that I was as purposeful as I'm describing it to you back then. But when I look back, like that's really my actions were in line with that, that it was like, Hey, I'm just going to take these leads because they might turn into something. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh, you can convert these, like come join my team. And then I sold, I closed 42 buyers in one year. I think that was in 2010 and then decided to go out on my own after that. But it was like, you know, everything came because I was doing something that on paper wasn't going to make me, you know, it wasn't something that was in a book like go work internet leads for what probably 40% or 30% or whatever that was go hustle, you know, and call them 17 times just to get 30%, then drive them around to the 20,000 homes that were on the market, in 2010, <laughs> you know, and, and deal with them. But it all sets you up, you know, to, uh, to build a big business, I created that skill that then I was able to bring people onto my team and teach them that and then, you know, that leads well, to 1,500 past clients. I mean, a couple things there. One, you know, you taking over internet leads was better than you calling in a phone book. You know, your conversion yeah. percentage is probably way higher, yeah, you know, exactly. uh, with that. But you cut your teeth doing the heart thing, and then it just got easier for you, right? And then the second thing is like 42 deals in 2010. I hope you guys, you know, just put that in perspective of the Columbus market. I think our average sales price in 2011 when I got in was like 150, right? So we're not talking $350,000 homes or a $300,000 average sales price today and still getting the 30%, you know, after splits and, and all that. And then factor in time because back then we would show one client 10 homes in a weekend, you yeah. know, or in a day. Yeah, <laughs> you know, sometimes just, those were those days. And, you know, yeah, five in Hilliard, three in Worthington, yeah. two in Delaware, like... Yeah, because you could. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. No, no. I mean, I think it's just I think sometimes, you know, it's good to have that perspective because, um, you know, I see it from time to time. Agents get in and they're like, oh, Internet leads this, that or whatever. And I'm like, look, it's an opportunity. 
right? Like at the end of the day, all we need as agents are opportunities. How many opportunities can we produce every single day? It doesn't matter how it comes, but which ones are we, you know, going to focus on and, and what are we going to go after day in and day out? But so Troy, 2010, 2011, you decide to kind of go on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's when I went Walk on me my through own. that. Um, so I actually partnered cause I was too big of a wuss, uh, to be frank with you, um, to go out and do it on my own completely. So I partnered with another older agent, um, just really for the confidence, to be honest with you. And even though I ha had had those successes, there was a comfort level in just being in business with somebody else. Um, but that quickly, the next year, it, it existed for a year. I wouldn't recommend partnerships, to be honest with you. They rarely work. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, it was another one of those things where it was, number one, a learning opportunity. That was probably the most inexpensive way to learn that partnerships didn't work. And number two, it gave me the confidence to do it. So I, I went into a partnership. I sold like four times as many houses as he did that next year. And I was like, OK, this you're older than me, so you're not going to be around as long. And, and I'm doing all the business like this just doesn't it's not a good fit. But what it did do is it just made me recognize that, number one, I could do it on my own. Number two, I could do it on my own and pay an assistant. And so that so then the next year I went completely on my own, hired my first my own assistant for the first time. And then, you know, I think somebody came to me and said, like, hey, we've got this guy looking to to join a team. Um, I got super lucky because he turned out to be an amazing buyer's agent for me um, and then built built my team from there. Um, I think at one point we had up to 10 people on the team right before I became uh, decided to take the leadership role here at consultants. So um, I don't know if you want me to keep going through my timeline yeah. present day. Well, I wanted I wanted to like unpack that decision of being scared to take that leap of faith on your own, you know, because because you're right. You know, we see it time and time again. This agent partners up with another agent and then all of a sudden a month later, two months later, it's like partnership no more. Can you can you just dive into and maybe go back to that moment of like um, ready to take that step to leave a team, but not really comfortable, confident enough that you can do it on your own? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest reason, you know, knowing what I know now is just that we all, I think the average real estate agent is a high I personality. We like to be around people. And um, the idea of leaving a team where you're around people that most of the time you like um, and respect to go out on this island by yourself. Um, what I've learned, and I'm sure that you've experience the same thing all the time with you guys as team is that when most people are honest with themselves the money is not the reason why they're in this business um mm -hmm. they they would rather have that team camaraderie they would rather not have to deal with all the things that being the business owner per, gives you to deal with and so the unknown of all of that stuff because remember i mean i was never a business owner i was never yeah. i mean i was just stumbling my way through in in many ways um so yeah i like i said i still would go back and do it exactly the same way because of the confidence that it gave me when i went out on my own um but i think uh i think you need to be really careful about who you partner with and I think you need to be really careful how you do it. I think I recently um, kind of talked through some situations with another agent and he had said, um, you know, I think the, the advice going on out there right now for partnerships is make sure that you, you know, do kind of like a silent partnership for at least three to six months and make sure that you guys are enjoying working together, that it's a good working relationship before you go rebrand everything, which is the most fun thing for the high I personalities to do. But it spends a ton of time and a ton of money 
and it only works out like i mean running through my head right now are like 50 examples that i could publicly throw out here of people that are super successful that tried the partnership thing and it just falls flat on its face 90 percent of the time yeah and i think you mentioned something there that i think is important and you know i'm not a business person um yes i definitely you wasn't no, I, no. I, well, I definitely was you are when now. i got into the business but you know that's one of the things that they don't teach us right and the majority of people that get into this business aren't business minded right it's usually their second third fourth fifth career they don't come from the business background all the time um and i think that's where a lot of agents struggle is understanding of exactly how to build out your real estate business you know what are the right decisions to make you know what, what are the right not just partnerships with other agents but partnerships with title lender you know home warranty and, and everything else that you could potentially be doing as well um doing internet leads or focusing on you know seller seminars whatever the case may be so um troy walk us up to like kind of current day of of where you're at in the industry team business all of that stuff yeah so i I then in, in 18, at the end of 18, I took a role as team leader here at Consultants. So I moved my team over here, um, did that for about 18 months during COVID. I actually really enjoyed, I think that was the first time we ever like had drinks or ate together. We yeah. knew each other, but, um, but uh, during COVID, I got to stay home with my boys who at the time were seven and nine. When my youngest was born, my wife, um, quit working at Huntington and started, we started buying investment properties, which we can get into if we want to later. But I, because of that, I was just focused on business. Not that I, we still did vacations and all that stuff. Right. I was, she was like home and I was working. Right. Um, and during COVID, I got to eat lunch with my boys. We went to go on a walk in the afternoon because we were all sick of sitting in the house. And just that made me realize that, you know, they were seven and nine, but kids don't want to be your best friend when they're 15. Like their friend, they have other friends that they want to hang out with. And so I just realized that my time was shorter than what I, you know, in the, my subconscious. So I decided to step away from the team leader role and go back into selling. Um, we had we had merged with someone with another agent when i was the team leader because i felt like my team was was lacking a leader um and but then COVID happened and we had this huge team and and i had to make a decision based on like the moment right and at mm -hmm. that moment in june of 2020 uh the market was not good <laughs> And, and there were a lot of rumors flying around about what the market was going to be like. So we decided as a family that the safest thing to do, if I was going to walk away from the money, the guaranteed money of being, you know, running the office, that it was going to be for us to just create a small team with my wife and I and work off of our database. So that's what we did for a couple of years. Um, but for me, I had been in a situation where I like, I had my director of operations that had been with me for eight years and she knew basically like she could type an email and you would have no idea it was her instead of me. And she would be able to handle all my stuff when I went on vacation. And, you know, like I would talk to her once or twice in a week vacation and everything would just be handled. And now I'm going on vacation and it's like, I'm trying to put listings on and do all this crap. And I'm like, what are you doing, dude? You're like going backwards. So anyway, so last year we decided to really jump back in um, to be able, because I, I love investing. I love real estate uh, for all the opportunities that it's given me, but investing is something that I really have a passion for. And so um, I'm looking to build my team back up. Um, so right now we've got myself, one other selling agent um, who does some listing, some buying, full-time director of operations. And then my wife is selling some, um, but we call her our vibe manager. So she does a lot of things, but she's definitely in charge of making sure we're all having fun. So, um, <laughs> and then we're, uh, 
we're looking to add two to three more agents here by the end of the second quarter. I've got a goal for myself of adding two more by the end of the month and I leave for vacation that, in a week. So I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> hey, that creating that sense of urgency is big in our business, right? Yep, exactly. Um, so Troy, was, was the investing stuff something that you always were interested in, even like kind of like college getting into the, the business? Or did you kind of grow into that as you saw the opportunities over the years, you know, show up? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's it's my passion beyond passion, um, because I believe that of all the things that I've done, um, that's the thing that's going to change my family tree the most, um, for sure. Real estate's afforded me the opportunity to learn yeah. it and make the money. But the investing is the thing that so many, it's so sad to me that agents in our business they will scream from the mountaintops all day about how great of an investment real estate is, but they're thinking of it from the context of owning your home versus renting it. And what they don't do is take that next step. And the day that they put their last sign in the yard is the day that they make, make their last dollar. Yeah. Um, and you see agents that are in their 70s and sometimes 80s that are still selling houses, not because they want to, but because they have to. And yeah. that is something that is is a core thing for me anybody that comes into my world whether you're on my team whether you're not it's like hey how can we get you like using your knowledge because there are very few industries where what you do every day can get turn can turn you into a millionaire with almost no additional effort but it's mm -hmm. the lack of willing to it's the desire of instant gratification that completely keeps almost all real estate agents away from doing it. So to answer your question, it's not something I was into. It's something I totally give Jim and Linda McKissick the credit for when they wrote the book hold and they would come and, you know, talk at the office. And I just, I just stole their formula starting in 2013. And it was basically what now everybody knows it as the Burr method, but I bought a house in 11, put a, uh, saved up money, put a new kitchen in it, got an equity line, bought my first condo for like $50,000 off of Sankus, put 10 in it, put a renter in there and use that formula. Like as long as it's, as long as the after repair value is at least 20%, 25% more than what I've got in it. And I can cash flow 300 bucks a month that I'm doing it. Now those deals are really hard to find now, <laughs> but back then you could do it. Um, and that's what I just did that over and over again. Like I said, my wife had quit in 2013. So I would find the deals and she would manage the rehab. Um, and we, we bought between 2013 and eight and 2018. I think we had like 11 or 12, 10 or 11 doors maybe. Um, and then since now we've got 15, wow. um, and so, yeah, just always growing. And I would, I mean, I feel like I can make that like a hundred pretty easily if I focus on it. It's always just been, you know, when I have time, I bought almost all my properties in December when I'm slow in real estate. Plus, I think it's a great time to buy investment yeah. properties, but it's not been even close to front of mind for me. So are you doing any Airbnbs or just long term? Yeah, so we've got um, we have a house in Tennessee on Norris Lake. So that's how we kind of dipped our toes in the water. And yeah. then um, last year we turned one of our long term properties um, down on uh, we we own a lot in Wineland Park. Okay. Um, and so one of our places on Seventh we did, and then we bought the house next to it last summer. And uh, so both of those are Airbnbs, and then we have the one in Tennessee. No, that's awesome. You know, you're, you're, you're so right. And it kind of goes back to that, you know, I think agents are just nervous to, to, to make that jump into the investing space a little bit, right? Because we don't have guaranteed, you know, income and, and how are we going to be able to afford, you know, our both mortgages and things like that. I just had this conversation with an agent, you know, the other day about an Airbnb and, um, you know, I was like, look, at the end of the day, like, it's going to be fine. You know, real estate, right? Like if the numbers work, the numbers are going to be okay. You know, just pull the trigger, just 
get yourself over the edge. It's supposed to be a little bit scary, right? Scariest but- day of my life buying that $50,000 <laughs> condo. I remember, I mean, dude, I can see it. It's so ingrained in my head. I can feel it right now being like, dude, what are you doing buying something that you don't need to live in? Like you just agreed to have, and that, it was like, what, a seven, $600 mortgage. Like you just agreed to have a $600 payment for nothing, no guarantee. Um, but then once you do it a couple of times, it's like, I have no problem buying something with no inspection, sight unseen, as long as yeah. the numbers work, because I know what the worst case scenario is. And it's right. Not bad. Yeah. You know, worst case scenario, we got to sell it. Okay, yeah. whatever. You know, like, yeah. all right, cool. <laughs> you know, but yeah, no like, if, and I, I, I'm with you, right? If, if we're as agents screaming, hey, buy real estate, buy real estate, buy real estate, it's a, it's a great investment, you know, long term, this and that, you know, you should probably be, you know, dipping your toes into that side of, of the industry as well. Because I'm like you, like, to me, real estate's the vehicle, you know, it's not the end game. You know, I love, I, I like helping people buy and sell real estate. I love helping uh, real estate agents find success in this business, but even the people that I help buy and sell, my conversation with them is investment. Yeah. Like this isn't the, a lovey dovey, you know. Like we're not living here thirty years. This isn't when your grandma bought their house, you know. This is an investment. You're probably going to be here five years, maybe seven, and then you're going to move on, you know. So we have to think of it as an investment. If we do it right. You're going to put yourself in a way better position and your family in a way better position than, than not. So yeah, I love, I love that you're in the, you know, now when I got in 2011 and 22, you're 22, I didn't know anything about real estate. So I missed all of that opportunity in the beginning. I'm waiting for the next crash to happen because I know, I'm ready. Well, I'm ready now. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the thing is though, I would, I think one of the biggest, and we can go down this rabbit hole or not, you're feel, feel free to pull me back out of it. But the bit, there's two really big mistakes that I think people make on the investment side. Number one is they think that they have to save every dollar. You know, most people, I think I saw, where, where did I see that? I'm a, I'm a numbers nerd. I, every month I do a like market update. So I'm always digging for stuff. But, um, but I saw something that like the average uh, homeowner right now has something like 36% equity in their home. And the reality is the way that we built our entire business. Now I know there's not $50,000 condos, but also to your point earlier, everybody's house on average was worth $180,000. So if you want to talk about the percentage of equity that you had to have in your house in order to buy an investment property. So if you own a $400,000 house and you bought it five years ago for two fifty, dollars you can go to Huntington Bank right now and access, depending on how much you put down, somewhere in the two to $300,000 range at, and let's just say it's at 7%, who cares, whatever. It's an interest only loan. And so you go out and buy a hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000 condo that needs a little bit of work that could be worth two fifty dollars if you fix it up. And you've still got $50,000 left on your equity line for the worst case scenario, right? Like, let's say they don't pay their rent for six months. Let's say somebody moves in and trashes the kitchen or, you you know, you have to replace all of the carpeting. Like, first of all, those things, unless you're buying in D class areas, like really rough areas, I've never, and I'm going to knock on wood, but I've never had a tenant that trashed a house to that level. My rule, I've tried to stay at or above a thousand dollars a month now that's more like 12 or 13 because i didn't want those issues but that yeah. doesn't mean you can't have success in that arena but i do think you need to have bigger reserves if you're especially if you're, if you're sub 1000 but either way like there are ways that almost everybody listening to this could get into investing right now with what they have but they just aren't willing to look for ways that they can leverage their current situation. The only thing they can think of is, well, I can't save $200,000 in cash to go buy something. Well, you don't have to do that. Um, but you need to listen to bigger pockets or listen to whatever and make sure that you learn how to do it 
So then you can go tell other people. And the last thing I'll say about that is it's made a huge impact in my business. I mean, right now, just recently, I had a, a client of mine who came to me as an investor. He bought $120,000 property from me probably about seven years ago. He then proceeded to buy, and he had been working with another agent, got him from my lender. It's a long story, but it's a great story. And he bought five or six properties, 150. Two years ago, he called me and he's like, hey, I've got too much going on with my kids. I need to liquidate my portfolio. I closed 10, I sold 10 duplexes in three months for him. And then now he's selling his principal residence and buying another one, which is more, a, a larger amount than what all of those were together. And the only reason I was able to do that is because I had invested in real estate and knew how to speak the language. Yeah. Investors are so used to talking to agents that don't know anything about real estate investing. As soon as they meet one who can talk to them about return on investment, ROI, how to pull equity out, how to move money around, they will grab onto you and never let go. And you will make so much more money than than you're making now slinging people's houses that are moving every seven years especially if you help that person get in that wants to learn investing right like i have kind of a similar situation it was a internet lead he's like i got fifty thousand dollars cash to work with has an agent in the family that's like i can't help you and i'm like look if i do my job on this first one you'll be a client of mine for life because if we do it right, you're going to make money and you're going to keep coming back to me. He has now bought four houses through me and um, just uh, reached out to me this past week. And we're going to get him connected to buy an Airbnb. Um, so five houses since 2018. And he started with $50,000 cash. Um, and now he's probably working, you know, well over or close to a million dollars in, in real estate assets when it's all said and done. Yeah. And how much equity does he have? He probably has three or four hundred thousand dollars, maybe more in equity. That's how many people listening to this podcast have three or four hundred thousand dollars in net worth. I yeah. mean, the, yeah, the first house was a two bedroom, one bath, uh, bought for forty three thousand dollars. And, and now it's probably worth 90 to 100, you know, because of the area. But you know, just that alone. Mm -hmm. And and normally I, and I told him, I was like, look, normally I would tell you not to buy this, but the tenant had already been there for five years, um, showed that paid on time. And I was like, for your first one, I, normally I would say no to this, but this situation, this deal makes sense. Fast forward. He now has that equity. He's tapped into it already to buy other ones, you know, that, that he's utilizing. And it's just, you know, you help that first person because a lot of people remember this. A lot of people aren't taught how to invest their money. They're not taught how to go out and invest into real estate. Um, and if you can be that agent that provides that information and that knowledge and can articulate it, you know, in a way that they understand it and help them make the money, not only do you have them for life, but you have their, their friends, their family, you know, and, and people that they associate with. Yeah. And I would say just to go a little bit further, because what does every agent tell you when you sit down with them and ask them why they got into real estate? I want to see if your answer is the same as what as mine. Normally, it's I want to invest in real estate. <laughs> no, I'm talking about an agent. You're sitting across the table from them and you ask them, hey, why? Why are why did you pick getting into real estate? They're a bartender. Yeah, most most of it is they want to make more money. OK, I, I hear I love helping people a lot. OK. You know, and so my comment to that would be you're doing your clients a disservice by not understanding how to help them invest in real estate because you're keeping their family from all of that wealth. And mm. that's that's something that I think everybody should take to heart. Are you being the best agent you can be if you're not helping your people invest in real estate? I have another investor story. Guy called me to rent one of my properties like three years ago, four years ago, and house hacked. So him and him and his girlfriend have bought four places, one a year um, with, you know, started with a duplex, lived in one side, rented out the other, then turned that place and his side he was living in into an Airbnb, bought another duplex. 
and now just closed on another. So I guess it's three, three in three years. Plus, like to your point, he's referred me to another buddy to buy another investment property, Airbnb. Yeah. Those guys will 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 repay you time and time again because you're changing their life. Yeah. And, you know, think of like all the deals that you did in, in 2018, 2019, 2020, you know, where their their price point of their home has has probably, you know, close to doubled, um, depending on where they were at. Um, and, and like you said, they have all that equity. So as an agent, are you putting on, you know, those seminars to really educate them on on what they can do? I like what you said. You know, if your goal is to really help people, you're holding your clients back and their family back by not having that conversation with them. I like that. Um, Troy, I want to be respectful of your time. I know, you know, we dove onto the investing side because you're passionate about it. I love it. Um, I want to ask you this. What is a legacy goal of yours? That's a great question, man. So what would you consider a legacy goal? Give me an example. What's, some, of what's something goal? that you're looking to accomplish when you're no longer here? This question was asked to me at this point now several months ago uh, by another agent who read it in a book. And, and he, you know, they're like, hey, you know, a lot of times we're asked, what's your five year goal, 10 year goal, 25 year goal, whatever. But no one asks, like, what's that thing that you really want to accomplish when you're no longer here? Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic question. And I think what we've been talking about is really what it's about for me. Um, it's it's about and and it goes through my kids which is corny it's everybody's thing but i mean i've as my kids they're now 10 and almost 12 and some of the things that i've implemented that i've learned throughout the years from you know being around people like you and other people at you know that are growth minded about how to um just set people up for success and when I hear my son kind of walk through the locker room at hockey, like rolling his eyes, like, yeah, that's all I hear about at home. And then a couple months ago, another kid was like, well, you should be grateful that you hear that at home all the time. And I was like, what? Like, first of all, to hear, a, you know, an 11 year old say that, but it's like you start to see what you've the work that you've put in that sometimes felt like it was never going to come come to fruition. And so I think for me, the legacy goal is just that the people that I've been able to impact throughout my life, whether I'm lucky enough to be here for 90 years or not, whatever, uh, or 100 or 120, whatever that is, um, that they would be carrying that on. And things like that comment I made about investing is what I want to instill in people, because ultimately I know that personally I can't do everything. And so it's empowering other people to 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 meet their highest potential and i don't feel like i've reached my highest potential yet not even close and yet helping people understand and helping people get to where you know they can be on that road as well is really really what what i'm real into and everything that i do no i love that what was your what, um for me um I want to I want to make a dent in the failure rate of our industry. You know, I I believe that it should not be 86, 87 percent or whatever it is, you know, by the end of year two. I don't think, you know, I, I think real estate's hard, but it's simple. And it goes back to kind of what we were talking about in the beginning. You know, it's like a lot of people are not business minded. I wasn't salesy. I didn't know business. I wasn't an entrepreneur. I just got lucky and found the right person at the right time when I got into the business. And I think a lot of people get their license. And again, we can go down the rabbit hole of our industry and, and NAR and, and, and all of those things, right? I understand that they, they want the, the, the bar to be lower so we have more people in it. But I don't think we actually set them up for success once they are licensed, it's, it's almost like a money grab, right? It's right. almost like give us your 1200 bucks and, and thank you. Right. That and is what it is. Don't. So, don't it. so my, 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 my mission is to help new agents get into this business and to give them the road. That's why I love having, you know, someone like yourself and other top performers in our market on here to share the journey. It's not all, 
Instagram, you know, $200,000 cars and big houses, you know, it's, Hey, I called from a phone book, <laughs> you know, Hey, I, I put in the work. Um, and, and that works for some people that doesn't work for everyone, but you know, as people getting into this business, they have to understand or, or learn that it all works, but you need to make sure that you f have a game plan in place to follow it. No matter what it is that you want to focus on to build your business, there has to be a game plan and how do we execute it and what do we need to focus on day in and day out. And if we take care of those things, the rest will take care of itself. And so that's mine is impacting yeah, that, awesome. that failure rate because, um, Personally, I got lucky, you know, with, with yeah. my situation. And um, I know there's a you lot of people. You created your own luck, bro. Well, you know, thankfully, uh, Tracy Chambers, I owe everything to her because she is the only person that responded to my email inquiry about getting into the business. And, um, you know, met with her and she connected me with Ryan and, and I've been with him since day one, you know, and um, <laughs> I emailed more people than just Tracy she was just the one that happened to answer and, and say, Hey, come sit down with me and let's talk. So, uh, but yeah, that's, that's my mission. Yeah. That's, I mean, like I said, that's very, it's not the same. Mine is more investing and growing wealth through real estate, but same idea. And I, I agree with everything that you said. I do a little bit of coaching too. And when I was team leader, obviously you do a lot of that. And right. that's what I, my favorite thing to say to new agents is, if you pick a way to lead generate in real estate, I can show you somebody who's become a millionaire. But the number one thing you've got to do is pick what you're going to pick and do it over and over again. And to steal one of my favorite Gary Keller quotes is success is boring. You know, the more yeah. bored you're willing to be by doing the same thing over and over again, the faster you're going to master it and the better you're going to be at it. Every yeah. time you start something new, you got to learn something completely new. And yep. so I always I've been saying a lot, you know, opportunities aren't always opportunities. It could be a distraction that really looks like an opportunity, because to your point, not only are you learning something new, but a lot of times we don't factor in the time that's going to take to actually put that thing into place and to actually execute on it. You know, we just like, oh, yeah, this is great. OK, well. It, calling expires is great, but are you willing to put the time and money and effort in and, and wait potentially six months before you start seeing, you know, some results roll in? So, Troy, I got one last question for you. If you could give our audience, you know, one piece of advice that, that you always share with real estate agents, what would that be? I just said it. Pick, pick no more than three sources of business and just crush those three sources. And one of them has to be your database. So really two, you get two, two to choose from. Um, there's just study after study that says the top producers really aren't doing much more than that. Um, mm -hmm. The majority of their business is coming from their top three lead sources. And it's just when I was in the team leader role, and I know you got a lot more agents on your team than I ever did. But the number one reason for failure, when you ask somebody after a year one or year two, what do you do in order to have success? Everybody that fails has 50 things to tell you about. And that means they did nothing well. Yeah. So yep. pick a couple and focus and just believe people like yourself that have been there and walked that road before that it's going to work. Yep. Yep. And don't be afraid like you said earlier, to steal what they're doing. Yep. None of us invented anything, right? We've all borrowed it from somewhere else or someone else. So um, find that person that's excelling in, in that, um, you know, you know, business source that you want to focus on and, and go learn from them, you know, go ask them questions. Um, Troy, thanks so much for, for your time today and jumping on with us. Uh, for those that are for, for those that are watching, if you guys are someone that's looking to buy, sell, invest, if you guys are a real estate agent looking to you know join a team, if you if you resonated with Troy, his phone number's down below, his his handles to social media is down below. But Troy, for those that are listening in, what's the best way for for someone to connect with you? Yeah, I would say just shoot me a text. That's probably the easiest since my number's down there six one four three two five eight three nine four. Um, but you can find me, my personal stuff on social as well. 
Um, but that's, yeah, just shoot me a text. Thanks so much for today. I, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, connecting with you and, and uh, hearing your journey. And if I could do anything for you in the future, please, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome. Well, I'll take a quick second since we're already long anyways and say thank you for everything you're doing for our industry. You're definitely on your journey, on your way to making that impact that you desire between doing this and doing your uh, morning huddle, which your consistency is freaking incredible. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, it is not 801 ever before I get that notification from Clubhouse. So um, you are cr you're crushing it and you're changing lives, whether you believe it or not. So thanks for all you're doing. No, thank you. Um, you said it. Success is boring, right? Yeah. <laughs> Troy, thanks so much. We'll talk here soon. All right. See you, man.